Hello and welcome to the American Cinema Foundation Movie Podcast. I am your host, Titus, and today I am joined in our postmodern conservative series by my friend and editor, Richard Reinge. We are doing a series at the American Cinema Foundation podcast about my mentor, Peter Lawler, on the third anniversary of his death. We are talking with a number of public intellectuals and other friends of his about his thought, his work, his influence. Richard, I'm very glad that you had the time to join me. I'm glad to, that you're part of this project. We are sorely in need of Peter, and at the same time, I know you because of Peter. I owe him my friendship with you, and that's something for which I am very grateful, and for the work, of course, we do together at the Law and Liberty. I would like to talk to you about especially your relationship with Peter and your work with him on American Catholic thought, But first of all, please introduce yourself for our audience, since it's your first time on our podcast. Thank you, Titus. This is uh, wonderful to be here. I appreciate you asking me on and also to discuss Peter Lawler, my relationship with him, and what I know about his work. I'm the editor of Law and Liberty, as you indicated. I also host a podcast show, Liberty Law Talk, and I do a fair uh, amount of writing myself. We appreciate your contributions immensely to our site. And I've co-authored a book uh, with Peter Lawler that was published by the University Press of Kansas in July of 2019 called A Constitution in Full, Recovering the Unwritten Foundation of American Liberty. Orestes Brownson is not a writer well-known enough, and this book is really the introduction of uh, Brownson to our time, and indeed timely, not least because things are coming unstuck in conservatism, and it is in a way dangerous, but in another way it's a chance to think again about the parts of American yeah. thinking, about what it is that we're supposed to be standing for and how we might go about it, and voices that we have not taken very seriously before should be taken seriously now. I came across Brownson myself reading Chris Lash, The True and Only Heaven, Lash's historical attack on progressive elites and his speaking out in favor of the tradition of American populism, which he suggests with quite some scholarly evidence has long been silenced. But Brownson, even in the tradition of American populism, is a very odd duck indeed. I'm always glad to read yours and Peter's thoughts on this. You mentioned before the podcast that you started with an essay on Brownson with Peter in Modern Age. Tell me, how did you meet Peter? How did you begin to write with him and your own career in light of your friendship with him? Yeah, no, funny. I met Peter when I came to work for Liberty Fund in 2008. And immediately I tapped him to do discussion leading for some of our conferences. Our conferences are Socratic seminars with you know, usually 15 or so participants. And at that time, I was organizing conferences for college students and graduate students. And I asked him to discussion lead those conferences. My real acquaintance with Peter, before actually getting to know him personally and, and becoming friends and having conversations with him, was actually when I was in law school in 2002, 2003. I started reading his books, and I read um, his book, Postmodernism, Rightly Understood. And then I read the ISI edition of Orestes Bronson's American Republic, uh, which he edited and wrote a wonderful introduction for, which I recommend uh, everyone who might find themselves interested in Orestes Bronson. So I knew him from the written word and thought very highly of him and thought he had something to say about America that I had not yet encountered in anyone else's writing. And his ability, very much informed by Orestes Bronson, to move beyond just a natural rights, individual rights, pro-capitalism, not that Peter was against capitalism, but that sort of account of what it meant to be conservative in America. Bronson disputes that, and, and Peter sort of built on that and wanted to talk about what the full sweep of Western history had disclosed to America, which America had built upon, uh, which he called the unwritten foundation or the unwritten constitution. I found that incredibly thoughtful and a much better way or a deeper way to reflect back on my country because in many ways it was true. It's hard to think about a lot of ideas, 
rights and concepts in the American Constitution, apart from the history across the centuries that precedes it. You know, one thing that Peter spent a lot of time discussing, learning from Bronson, also John Courtney Murray, was the deep truth of the freedom of religion clauses in the First Amendment. That is an attempt to separate the political society from the civil society in a foundational sense, because what we're saying with that is this is a true limit on government power. You cannot define the soul for your citizens. Your citizens are citizens and creatures and the soul is higher than the government, and the First Amendment is acknowledging that limit on government. That's, Peter would say, the single most important limit, because that's the one that allows us to think about the truth about who we are. That's a unique Christian inheritance to America. As Peter would argue, to the extent we are a Christian nation, it's in that very limited sense that the government cannot define for us what it means to be a human person that's given over to our souls and to the questions and conclusions that we come to in our churches or in our religious institutions. That is a huge part of what attracted me to Peter is moving beyond just certain limited, almost ideological pieces or strands of thinking about what it meant to be conservative in America. Yeah, this is perhaps the time when we should start thinking again and talking again about what it means for America to be Christian, because Christianity's relationship to the political situation and our relationship as Christians to the American Republic has changed. Christianity is no longer to be taken for granted in America. In certain ways, it is under political assault, lawsuits against freedom of religion, constantly press contemporary understanding of the First Amendment, which is not proving very solid or very profound. It is not true to the experience of Americans, but it is not true to the founding either. And at the same time, of course, Christians have to ask themselves how they will deal with being American. Where is the soul to the government? How are they supposed to understand themselves as human beings, as Peter would say, as persons? We are self-conscious mortals. We have a self, and that means that we see things from our own perspective. We are not disembodied minds. And in not being disembodied minds, we have to reflect on this condition of embodiment. Here begins our specifically human misery our fear of death and our suffering in the knowledge of all our limits, mortality being the most shocking one, but by no means the only one. We are also not perfectly wise and never can become so. We have to, therefore, look for our personal destiny. We have to think of how we can make the best of ourselves as individuals and what that means in relationship to other individuals, since we know within our limits we cannot be human alone, but only together. And in what ways that has to be thought of and arranged becomes therefore very, very important. This was a great concern for all the serious thinkers in America. As Peter liked to say, America is not simply a political regime. It is not simply a constitution in the sense of the constitution written down, occasionally amended, often assaulted by legislators or judges or the president and in need of defense. But it is not a constitution in the political science term of Aristotle or Plato either. Because, as you said, there is nobody who is in charge of defining the soul in America. People go to church to understand who they are, and they are free to do so. Some do and some don't. And that means that there is something other than politics that is in very deep tension with politics. And this has always been the way, as you said, this is history. Christianity in America is older than the constitution and the declaration and any political foundation. Yeah. No, I I, think Peter had this term. uh, We used it a couple of times. We use it in our book, a constitutional Thomism. That is to say, the in-betweenness of American constitutionalism and American life rightly understood. And what Peter meant by that term was that if one dominant strand in American thinking is individualism, and it's certainly there, that is an ideology. It's an incomplete account of the human person. It's an incomplete account of community and politics, but it's very powerful. And it does build a sense on the Christian truth about the uniqueness of the human person, our self-consciousness, our knowledge that we're not nothing, and the sense that precisely because we have this subjectivity, this experience of freedom and of choosing, that we aren't just materialistic beings, as the Darwinians would tell us. But of course, that individualistic account is also wrong in the sense that it ignores our relational being. And that's where, on one level, this other 
Darwinian animal part comes through in a powerful way to account for this relational part of our being and sort of gets right what, say, a Lockean individualism neglects. But of course, what it can account for is freedom. And it can't account for the individual. And really, even in the relational part, it can't account for love. All of these things are just sort of instincts or drives or impulses. Well, I think if we ask ourselves the question, you know, looking across at our husband or our wife or our children, is the love I feel for this person just an impulse or an instinct or a drive? I, I think most of us, maybe outside of academia, but even academics would say, of course it is. It's something more than that. And so there's that ground of, of freedom and love and truth. And that's what has to be accounted for. And our constitutional order uh, wants to allow us to pursue that. But primarily it wants us to do that as, as in-between beings. That is, as beings in family, beings in religion, and also that we're going to do that in communities. And that's where, so another aspect of the in-between constitution is it's not purely an individualistic libertarian constitution, but it's also not the progressive constitution of ever-growing government, reordering our lives in some historical pursuit of equality or perfection, as much as certain powerful politicians, elites, bureaucrats, PR types want to push us in that direction. The Constitution allows for a wide berth of government, particularly for states and local government. And that also is a good part because we do need at some level to participate as Republican citizens in the government. And by the way, those who constantly harp on this don't really want us to participate in a wide ranging way. They want us to participate in an ideological way. That is to say, on behalf of typically of more equality, more government or just exclusively to be in the private sphere. I think that's more of the libertarian position. Everything should just happen in the private sphere. So that's the constitutional Thomism. If you think about it, it's the balance for the embodied being who is soulful, material, animalistic at times, but also wants to know the truth about himself. There's no other animal on the earth that wonders why there's something rather than nothing. Why am I here? What is my life about? What should be the content of our laws? What is justice? I mean, all of these things testify to the dignity of the human being and the human person. The goal of American constitutionalism is that we can have those conversations best understood with each other and deliberation and compromise and giving of reasons, receiving of reasons. Why does this keep breaking down? I think it keeps breaking down, and this is very powerful right now. We're losing the consensus, that deep foundational agreement that guides conversation and God's disagreement, that we actually know who we are as a people. We're constituted and organized for political action. We seem to be losing that. We're increasingly two nations. As I said recently in a podcast with Father Robert Sirico, we're two nations stuck in a bad marriage. And right now, it just doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, we could say that the plain truth about uh, prudence in politics is if we cannot have a future together, we will certainly have a reckoning. Yes. If we cannot look forward to a common good, we will take revenge on each other. And so we have to look for continuities and for consensus in our lives in an age where it neither pays nor are people tempted to do so. Peter and you working on Bronson, this strikes me as an attempt to find an alternative, a way of grounding in American political thought, in American populism, since America is a democratic republic. People are going to vote and people are going to have their own opinions. People can express their political opinions, including by not voting if they no longer trust their government or trust that they can affect it. So we need to find some way to think about politics that ties us to the American past, but at the same time to the people. It cannot simply be ideas or it cannot simply be academic or even strictly partisan. There aren't that many partisans in the country. Peter was very attentive to this, and indeed, we can see that Christianity does provide still, or especially today, the only ground for conversation and for disagreements, because it is the only thing that still cuts across the divides. Christianity is a position and a belief of all the races and all the classes in America, of all the regions, if in different and, of course, not always reconcilable ways. Yeah. But at the same time, it is threatened. For the first time, it is possible politically and practically in America to create a new system of elites that are openly against Christianity and therefore against any possible consensus. 
And I think to some extent, Bronson is supposed to be a corrective to that, since he was a populist, anti-elitist, and an, a man attempting to educate Americans about what they really know about their own experience, about how they live their lives, and the political importance of all these facts so often neglected. Yeah, I, I think, you know, how does Bronson speak to us today? I think one thing is to remind us that who we are as human persons is, in effect, the purpose for government. That is to say, government exists to not just ward off evils, not just prevent theft or fraud or violence, but government is here as a part of who we are as persons who want to give an account to one another of what we believe and how we think we should be governed and live our lives together. So Bronson acknowledges, say, that the social contract is an aspect of the American founding. Uh, but what he really wants to build on are political communities in the states as united. So he says the United States, that term is really the states united. But now he's against secession. His most important book, The American Republic, is published in 1865. He loses two sons in the war. Visited, I've read with Abraham Lincoln in the White House where he urged him before Lincoln was ready to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. So he's very much as a union man. He's a union man, though, because he thinks the history of the country, that revealed to us that we are one people. We were searching for a form, a way to be united. And that was powerfully revealed in the movement for independence. And so the colonies remain separate. The Declaration of Independence gives you both wordings, united colonies, they're separate, but they also sign it together and they affirm it together. And the Declaration of Independence itself is a kind of loyalty oath, particularly if you read it all the way through until the end. And even the opening, the famous, we hold these truths to be self-evident. We hold them. So they're assigning these beliefs to each other and affirming them. So the colonies are united to win the war, they have the Articles of Confederation, and Bronson says, but it didn't work. Right? The Articles of Confederation fell apart into anarchic impotence, seemingly, because they didn't testify and make real who the American people were, which was really they were coming to be one people. And that's what the Constitution does. It affirms that oneness, the unity in states, and accords a national government certain powers, but they're general powers. They're the powers needed to govern the country as a whole, and that's it. But real work over morals and legislation and community is left to the states and the localities. And then there's this tremendous freedom. Bronson doesn't use the term civil society, but that's what he's talking about. Middle class life is going to be lived in civil society, largely apart from the direction and control of government. It will indirectly touch government. That's sort of the genius of American life. And the highest part of American life is even though you're going to be working a lot, you're going to be able to pursue the truth about the human person. And that's the sort of inheritance of rights from Christianity that comes directly into America. But we also inherit Republican government from the classical world. But we conjugate these things much better than they were. So there's a lot of learning. Then there's the common law as well, which is an enormously beneficial system of law, of private rights, facilitating commerce, but also urging the importance of property rights. So all these things come together powerfully in the American founding. And we sort of have now taken one piece of that, particularly conservatives, and that's the individualistic strand. Progressives sort of work that out because it's dialectical. If everything is individualistic, then you do turn into sort of a collective strand. And that's sort of where we, we have these two battles. Now we have the attempt to disestablish the American founding and the 1619 project as well. And so that's the attempt really to rule out all of the things Bronson was talking about and the founding and the way in which the founding has these principles of freedom properly understood. So we're, we're in a difficult jam. The difficulty with Bronson is I can't reduce him to a one or two sentence soundbite. It involves some learning and some thinking, not only about what he said, but about who and what our country is. Same thing with Tocqueville, right? Same thing with another thinker who's very close to Bronson in many ways, John Courtney Murray, and even Peter Lawler. The whole idea of postmodernism rightly understood is that modernity fails. And what comes after that? Is it going to be sort of the abolition of reality and reason as the postmodernists affirm? Or is postmodernism the opportunity to go back and bring forward the truth about the human person? You know, in light of the things that we've gained, we don't want to dismiss science and commerce and all of this, but that we need to recover these truths. Yeah, Peter saw perhaps earlier than most people that for all the great victory in the Cold War, America was threatening to come apart. 
that especially at the elite level, the reliance on expertise and the obsession with a very small number of ideas would lead people to extremes in politics that would be very, very dangerous. Partly because of the Catholic writer, the essayist and novelist Walker Percy, his favorite American artist. Yes. He understood very well how dangerous experts are. And he explained that he fears that increasingly liberalism and libertarianism are coming together in an attack on America. The libertarians want to abandon civil society because of the duties it imposes on us. Individual freedom turns out to mean negating all the things that make our lives worthwhile because they are not purely and simply chosen. They are partly chosen. You have to choose to be part of a church, to start a family, even to be part of any business enterprise or your friendships for that matter, or hobbies or online communities. There's always choice in these things, but it's not simply choice. Yeah, no. Yeah, and that, they're not simply created. That's right. That's right. And I, now I think, you know, our, our libertarian friends would affirm their commitment to civil society and family. And even today, the Cato Institute will defend religious freedom them on most of the big cases they tend to write briefs in favor. The, I think the point you're raising is do they understand the depth of those obligations? Yes, indeed. Does a purely individualistic account understand this part of human nature? And I think that's the rub. Marriage is chosen, as you say, but at a certain point, it can't be unchosen. And if it is, great damage ensues from separation. Same thing with religion, right? It's a very big deal to change one's religious faith, which is not to knock conversion, but it is a change and it's a turning and it's a new way of thinking about your soul and yourself. So yeah, that too cannot just simply be unmade, not without great costs. These are these relational parts are essential because they form our whole and the way we're going to think about ourselves. And they're going to help us contextualize politics in a limited government and a Republican constitution. We come to understand why it should be limited and its potentials for danger, what it can do and what it can't do, and the harms it can pose to the communities that we love and that we care about. I think the problem now that I continue to see is many Americans don't really know what they believe in. They don't know if they believe in much. And of course, we have obviously dissolution in the family. We have record numbers of people in America just living single lives. Our younger people in their 20s right now, in their 30s, very high rates relative to past generations. They're not married. They're single. They don't have children. And so when you live that way, I think it becomes increasingly difficult to resist centralization of government power and to see your identity and your personhood apart from that power and apart from the claims they might make upon you. If you recall, during the 2012 presidential campaign, the Obama campaign released a cartoon of Julia to show how all of the programs that progressives support would benefit her. This is a woman who goes through her entire life single and does everything with the help of government, including raise her daughter, which she raises as a single mother. Many of us saw that and thought it was a nightmare. I think most progressives saw it and, and applauded and thought this was an ideal way to live a life, everything being sort of on your terms. And when it couldn't be on your terms, the government was there. I would submit that is not human flourishing to the extent we embrace that or think that human beings can just sort of live in contractual relationships simply. Uh, we're going to miss freedom and responsibility and the promise of limited government and constitutionalism. Yeah, we are in a situation where the basic facts of life have become something that's stranger than illegality, since quarreling about what's legal, what's not, whether we tolerate certain laws or we tolerate the breaking of certain laws, happens all the time. But there's something far stranger than that, which is the unthinkable. It has become unthinkable in the terms of individualism to tell people that you can do all the sorts of things you want to do with your life, but there are a few that you can't that there are certain facts about human life that are essentially relational. You can't give birth to yourself. There have to be other people to have given birth to you, and that cannot be done in a libertarian way or with the progressive federal government. Right. And when you die, do you want to be alone and forgotten? Who really thinks that way? Yeah. But our relational identity is in some ways understood. That is to say, people today, as Peter continuously pointed out in his writing, even beyond politics and culture, Young people often complain about how miserable they are precisely because, as you say, for the first time in American history, we have, through our many successes, invented a generation that is unmarried. Yeah. There has never been such instability, and we'll see what comes of it. Maybe this individualism is the greatest thing ever, but the people caught in it seem to hate it, and it seems to encourage both the young men and the young women to become mutually antagonistic parties. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, we remember the old American joke, nobody can win the war of the sexes. There's too much fraternization with the enemy. Well, I mean, we'll see. Yeah. This has never been this way before. After the generation of American divorce, now there is a generation of no marriage. That solves the divorce problem in a way. So like the statistics look great, but uh, it causes a lot of trouble. And so we have to now speak publicly to take seriously the facts of our lives, the things that make us as human beings relational. And Peter saw that what he called thomism or realism in America means being realistic about the evidence of our eyes. Are single people all that happy or do they themselves wish for a love and a friendship that they can trust, hopefully for life? Yeah. What is the real evidence of our lives? Do people long for God or not? Is it the case that now that we are in a new progressive political situation where progressives get to define by identity a human being or a marriage? Our conservatism is such a failure that we say conservatism believes the family is the basis of society. And in the next period, we say, and also we have managed to give liberal progressives absolute control over defining yeah. family and marriage and well, new identity as a yeah. person. Great. That's an achievement of our new individualism. Well, I think... Um, or I think... we take this other turn that Peter looked for help for from people like Bronson and Murray and other authors to insist on taking seriously what we all know. We don't talk about it or we don't give it public dignity but we all know that we are relational beings you know listening to you know i, I think uh, and peter and i talked a lot about because when we were writing together same-sex marriage was still an issue it was still a contested issue and in our book we have a chapter on obergefell i think peter came to accept same-sex marriage but i don't think he really thought it was going to be a problem systematically because it only became a live question and a live possibility because heterosexual marriage had broken down. Because heterosexuals themselves had largely accepted sort of a nominalistic understanding of human sexuality. That paved the way for same-sex marriage, which may or may not be sustainable. We don't know right now if heterosexual marriage in America is sustainable. There's a lot of evidence that it may not be. Absent a reinvocation of customs, mores, and you know, wide cultural, community, religious support for marriage, which now we don't have, which is why I think our young people see it as just another lifestyle option. It's not that progressives, when we talk about them, uh, we don't live in a totalitarian country. I don't think we even yet live in a softly despotic country. At times, it seems like we do. I think there are elements of sort of therapeutic deadening of our souls that we give into sometimes. But yet, there are also tremendous forms of resistance in America to what progressives propose, much more prevalent than you see in any other country, I think, in the West. There really is no other country other than, say, the United Kingdom that has a conservative movement the way we do, and a conservative movement that has these aspects of religion and family and community has live parts of the movement that really doesn't exist anywhere else. So there's tremendous sources of resistance in America. I think the problem is what the progressives have been able to do is come along and on these questions, because Americans themselves, including elites, no longer believe that there are answers stemming from human nature, that there really isn't a natural law. There really aren't inbuilt purposes into human beings for how we should behave. Once that slowly became accepted, not just in uh, institutions of higher learning, but say we'll say left those institutions and filtered out and relativism became very common. And then relativism itself sort of gave way to egalitarianism. You know, the truth is just we should all be equal in every respect, in every way. Once that happened, certain things that seemed unthinkable, same-sex marriage once seemed unthinkable in America. I remember in the 1990s is you know, when this first happened. I think the state of Hawaii enacted same-sex unions in like 1997. And people thought that was like crazy and they just sort of dismissed it as a, a Hawaii thing. Now it's nationwide and it's an orthodoxy. But all those things became ultimately thinkable because, well, why shouldn't it be? And there was, I think most Americans struggled to give an answer and in the end didn't really have an answer or think there was an answer. Lawler wants to point back to Bronson and Murray as providing these ways of thinking about what it means to be a human person. And not only just what it means to be a human person, but then, well, how does that relate to law and government? Uh, how should it relate? Until we can ask those questions and presume that there is a nature, build on that with our reason point to answers that lead to human flourishing, then the nominalists win. Those who insist that we're just willful beings, defining things for ourselves, trying not to hurt other people, forming contracts with them. If we can't answer those basic questions, then we slowly lose the ground of American freedom. And, you know, right now it seems to be slowly ebbing away. The recovery, it, on one level, you and I can articulate a recovery. 
uh, on the level of ideas, how one makes that politically possible and something that people want to do and love and believe in and will commit to and sacrifice for. That's a very different proposition. Yeah, you know, we can say that, in fact, resistance to progressive ideology is, in some sense, widespread in America. Progressive ideology is by no means even fully in control of the Democrat Party, much less of the country. That's all true. And yet, finding public objections to it turns out to be quite hard. And finding ones that are popular turns out to be significantly harder. So somehow we have abandoned the public space. Somehow we have ended up in a situation that, you know, no, it's really, really funny. The public space is where people have riots or you have tourists on the National Mall, something like that. But at the same time, I think this does attract attention to the fact that we need not just anger, but love if we are going to have an opposition to a reductive, inhuman individualism that takes a partial truth, as Peter would say, and uh, runs away with it until it does something monstrous, because it ignores the other things about our country, about our way of thinking, about our history, and about our human nature that are also true. So we need a more complete picture. We especially mm-hmm. need to insist on those things that have long been ignored or endangered, really. Yeah. As you say, it's not actually that hard, you know, if every I can just go on Amazon and buy your and Peter's book on Restless Brown. So everybody <laughs> should. It's a good read. Well, thank you. It'll make people feel you're good and it'll teach them something. Like, this is about what you can hope. But these are ideas and yeah. ideas are not the same as life. Part of Peter's point that we're not just rights-bearing creatures, we are also God-fearing creatures. We are also loving creatures. We are also family creatures. We're also friends. We're also other things. These things have to somehow be put together, as you say. How do we in light of what we know about how we live our lives, think about law and government and politics. That means that we need to insist again on these things because we have to get from ideas to actions, and that requires some kind of in-between. After all, I mean, in a crazy way, for the first time in America, it's easier for an American teenager to think he's going to be a celebrity on YouTube than he's going to be a father or a mother. (laughs) In a way, it's true, since it's not just that we don't have marriages, it's that there's not that many kids around. Americans have, in a way, decided, like it seems all Western people have decided, it's not worth having more of us. Just have enough of us to keep it going. Even that is a doubtful proposition, it seems. As you say, it's not clear that individualism will lose. But we don't want to fully give in to this problem, the birth dearth, as Peter put it. We do not have enough babies because it's a simple statement that we don't really want to deal with the drama of mortality and our love for each other. But maybe it's just that we don't know how to do it. Maybe it's that we cannot go from ideas to practices. We can't really believe the things that we know and therefore act on it because we lack the experience. And so we need something, on the one hand, what you learn from Peter is natural law. We should understand that our human nature and politics are tied up. But in another sense, as Peter likes to say, he learned from Orestes Brownson that the American founders built better than they knew, that it's not Mm -hmm. just politics, it's not just constitutional law. American life also included many other things from, as you said, the common law to Christianity to all sorts of other things. And these things are also very important for the same reason we like to see true stories. Yeah. It's well, more believable if actual human beings do these things and if it's our predecessors, our previous generations, our forebears, then it's probably things that we can also do. It's interesting, before we got on this podcast, I heard a poll result. Pew Research commissioned a poll asking a range of questions about America. One of those questions was, are you proud to be an American? Across all Americans, but they broke it specifically down by age. So of Americans aged 20 to 29, only 20% are proud to call themselves Americans. I wonder what Peter would think of that. I think he would say it must amount to an abandonment of education and not just formal education, an abandonment of the things you pick up in your family, in your neighborhood, in your community, what you take from authority figures about your country, that it's rights, it's civic liturgy, signals, symbols, all of these things are good. How an entire generation seemingly no longer believes that their country is good. How does that come about? If I had to put words in Peter's mouth, I think he would suggest that a country that had become so unrelational and so decommitted to one another, has proven itself incapable of transmitting its heritage in any form or fashion to the next generation. Now, the poll results got better the older you went, but nevertheless, there it is. And so there are real costs when we lose connections with other people, with communities, and also with our country beyond just being committed to 
what distributional advantages it might provide to you, but to see yourself as a part of it. What do you make of that poll result, Titus? Uh, what do you think Peter would make of it? it? It seems to me a really disconcerting number. Yeah, it is. It is very disconcerting. And I think you're right. The way Peter thought about this stuff is that you have to really see the consequences of our failure to be relational beings. That's what it means to be American, not just to say I'm an American. And the consequences will wake you up. Peter explains in Postmodernism Rightly Understood, as well as in other books, that things are constantly getting better and worse. And part of the getting better is when you get smacked upside the head by reality and learn better. Yes. Suffering for your mistakes is a very necessary lesson. And I agree with you. This is a judgment on what we've actually done as a nation. And it's not just public speeches. It's not just schools, as you say. People pick it up from their families. People pick it up from their friends. Are you proud to be an American? America. Well, my guess is that people are just too far from America. Yeah. America is something you see on TV. Yeah. And I think that there's so much misery in people that they take it out on America. You can't build a society where people whose parents were divorced, where they themselves find marriage implausible or scary. And you can do all these things, but the consequences will be, I promise you, this is a democracy. People will take it out on the country and people will take it out on each other in broad groups. Yeah. My fear is that like I saw this coming. I have a, a, a phrase for it, which is unfortunately not the Peter Lawler phrase. He was always witty and had an upside and I don't always have an upside. I have a dark side that says we have raised a generation of dishonored sons and disgraced daughters and they're not going to be peaceful about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think we look at these protests and riots that have convulsed America now for two weeks. Some nights have been worse than others. We're re relative peace now, although the shooting in Atlanta this weekend re-engineered rioting in that city. The death of George Floyd is horrible. And there have been other horrible deaths of young black men, primarily and women, at the hands of police that are unjust. But in no way, shape, or form are there statistical evidence that would support the premise of Black Lives Matter, that the police are out to take down young black men. What does seem to be the case is we have a lot of people very unhappy very dislocated and disoriented about who they are, what they're supposed to be, what they're supposed to do. They have no script. It's hard to go through life without some kind of a script. That's not to attack anyone's freedom or individuality, but we're all have certain expectations given to us of how we should behave that no longer exists throughout a large portion of our society. Where it does exist is sort of in that top income quintile. Upper middle class Americans give a script to their children of success, be a success. They model that for them in their own careers. So they have a script. They know what to do. Unfortunately, they never tie those privileges and that success to duties to bring in other Americans into those virtues, into that virtuous life. They sort of engage in those you know, politics of progressive psychology and bemoan America. So that has to be driving the violence. It has to be driving this. Also, not the elites making the arguments, but this much more wider acceptance than I would have thought of, say, the 1619 Project, that America itself is structurally racist. But what that really means is we're evil and you can't remedy, redeem, purify or overcome this evil. It's baked into the bones. And this is disastrous for our country. Yeah. And, you know, Peter's answer to push back on that, I don't know that there's, maybe you do, I, I don't know that he thought necessarily about that, but it owes primarily to very false anthropology and a very deranged understanding of what it means to be a human person. The solutions are going to be in the middle class virtues and how those touch the truth of the human person. Yes, indeed. We are in a situation where we have to look for an upside. We can't simply say, well, let's have more of the anger or let's just stop dealing with this. Let's just give up. We have to deal with this problem and that requires certain sources of hope. Teaching and, and learning about American traditions and practices is necessary so that we know, first of all, like, you know, America has been through horror before. As you said, Orestes Brownson came with his best statement on America after the Civil War. Within four score and seven years, in fact, Americans came to murdering each other in unprecedented and unrepeated, thank God, numbers. Yes. It's not that shocking. Yeah. You have to see that Americans have had it very, very good, and they've learned to hate that. And partly it's because there is something desiccating our souls and our public ideology. We have failed at all sorts of things. One way I think about this is that the problem with our liberal progress is that we have not solved our problems as much as we have started to think of them as bought and paid for. 
there were always poor people in America or miserable people, but now they're all bought and paid for by the federal government in every way from the jails to the welfare redistribution state to, you know, giving naloxone to drug addicts, trying to save people from overdoses. Yeah. All of it is bought and paid for by the government. There were always poor people, there was always oppression of black people in America, but now all of this stuff is arranged by the government. Are black people happy? Why are they screaming about Black Lives Matter? The ones who are, which is not the American black population, but is some people and a lot of support at the distance from the madness. Surely black people do not, in fact, consent to or invite destruction of their livelihoods. It's just that our elites carefully hide those people. The people who died or whose lives are destroyed don't matter. Their kids don't matter. The silent majority in America, if it exists, it only exists as silent. When people speak up, there is no majority left. But now the misery is bought and paid for by the government, egged on by elites, justified. This is the situation, and we cannot rely on these elites. We're going to need other kinds of elites. We're going to need pride. We're going to need the right combination of love and anger. If you do not have some measure of happiness and hope, you cannot really love things because you believe that they'll just go to hell that they came up by chance and they'll go away by chance and you shouldn't get attached. You become damaged goods and then you become proud of being that. That's what Twitter is. A lot of people advertising that they are damaged goods. It's become a new form of chic and it's dangerous. But it is also a lot of people crying out desperately in a way for how miserable they are. We have to have improvements in practical ways for people to have hope, for them to then learn that they should be angry in protection of what they love. That's also a necessity of life. We need certain good things in life to be proud of, to defend angrily when they are under attack, to understand that is to say that we are attached to people and to things that are perishable, but still lovable and still good. Mm. And this has become difficult and perhaps only crisis can teach people that they still have something to lose, just like that they still have a spirit in them of resistance, that they're not just going to say cosmic forces have shaped and misshaped me and if I'm a monster it's because the world has made me a monster because America is evil. Yeah. That's a mad thing to say but plausible unfortunately. Yeah, I think as I listen to you as well what occurs to me and I think Peter would be writing columns to this effect is we have a new conservatism at least its elements. I think the ideas more or less are going to stay the same but with different emphases of course. But we have to bring in find who are the new groups that are going to compose a silent majority. Because the groups that have composed the silent majority largely, I think, are destined to shrink. But that doesn't mean that it's over. It means that the coalitions change. Jason Riley today in the Wall Street Journal, the black silent majority that's out there. Asian Americans as well. They need to be reached and talked to and brought into conversations about what we need to conserve in this country because parts of these communities, uh, including, we'll say broadly, Hispanic Americans, also wanting, practicing, loving the middle class virtues that compose a constitutional undergirding. So we've got to bring them in as well. Yeah, that's right. It is time to form a new American majority. America has to be both democratic, that is to say everybody gets to vote, or to say I don't give a damn about your party, I'm not voting. But everybody also has to, to some extent, have good things, a middle class way of life that they wish to conserve. These two things have to go together, and it does mean that we should move away from certain of the delusions that have led us to these defeats, and I think we will know the right way if we think, as you say, there are lots of people in America who in fact don't have representation, what they believe in, what they love, just is not talked about or helped to organize in the ways that they find plausible, admirable, so that they will commit to them. There is no dignity in being part of the various forms of American citizenship because our republicanism is in the dustbin of history, it seems. Well, it's still a living part of America at some level and the need for us so that we might revive it. And that is also true to a significant extent of the Christian heritage. It's the easiest way for Americans to reach across their differences and help each other to save lives and to save souls in a way, to help the saving of souls, is to go help out. Show that people are not that selfish or that paralyzed, that they will go and help out. But this also requires a certain degree of organization and public voice so that people know that they are not alone. This is perhaps the terrible thing that we've replaced politics by television. People can watch America burn on TV and then go back to whatever they were doing 10 minutes before or whatever their schedule for tomorrow is. There is absolutely no connection between private and public life. 
we always see this in polls that people hate Congress, but they're okay with their congressman, that people hate the education system, but they like their teacher, or all of these sorts of things. And somehow there's no way as yet to bridge this. And I would say that is the major yeah. failure of the conservative movement. You conserve communities. You do not conserve a museum of ideas or documents or what have you. Those things have to be beliefs of people, and they cannot be beliefs of people unless people live by them. Well said, Titus. Unless they are part of activities and organizations. <laughs> I don't think I have anything more to add. I think I think you have summed <laughs> it up beautifully here at the end. Uh, yes, I think this is a good place to end our conversation. I think our audience by now should see what it is that Peter Lawler has to offer and what Orestes Bronson has to offer and what your book with Peter has to offer, since we need guidance and learning along with encouragement. And that means that we have to believe that what Americans have done before, they can do again, that what was possible for our forefathers is not now out of our reach. We have to, in a way, be proud of being Americans, but that means being proud of specific achievements and of specific possessions, not abstractions, but realities. We have to be realistic, as Peter would say. That is to say, look at the evidence of our eyes. Yes. What do we got? What are we missing? I, I agree completely. Richard, I owe our friendship to Peter. I owe my relationship with law and liberty to Peter, and I have every intention of living up in some way to that debt. The first thing that struck me when Peter died and I heard the news, uh, well, the second, the first thing that struck me is that I'll never talk to him again. And I had just published yeah, some yeah, second thoughts about Alan Bloom's closing of the American mind. And I was writing down notes about what I wanted to say to him. And yeah, it never happened because I delayed a couple of days. But the second thing that occurred to me is that all of us are still here. I owe him some kind of debt of gratitude, which strikes me as a friendship and helping out and continuing the project he set out yeah. to give a Christian witness, to speak up for Republican self-government and for the dignity of American life. Well said. I'm very happy that you're helping me in this way. I'm happy to have learned that Peter helped you in turn. I'm, I'm very grateful for your friendship is how I want to end. Thanks a lot, Richard. Well, thank you. You and I agree on all of those things. Peter invoked the same determination in me, and I look forward to us continuing to work together. And thank you for having me on. It's been wonderful. Good luck with your work, and all the best, Richard. All right. Bye-bye. You too. I look forward to hearing it. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>